As we begin this story, I'd like to read a couple of verses from Ephesians chapter 5. We read in verse 25, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. This is the story of one of my heroes, Fred Stanley Arnott. Fred Stanley Arnott lived from 1858 to 1914. When he was a little boy, about four years of age, his family moved to Hamilton, Scotland, which was at the time where the David Livingston's family lived. His sister was in David Livingston's daughter's class at school, and very often they would be invited to the Livingston home on Saturday. They were amazed at the curios and relics and books and letters that were stored there from the intrepid missionaries' journeys in Africa. And on one occasion, Livingston's daughter read a letter from David Livingston describing the horrors of the slave trade in Central Africa. He said at that time, he was just a boy, perhaps nine or ten years of age, if God spares me, I will go and help to right this wrong, he said. And a little bit later, when someone asked, what if no one sends you to Africa? He said, well then, in that case, I'll swim there. When he was 14, the Lord moved him to begin to prepare for going to Africa. He had been saved at the age of 11 through John 3.16, and he began to learn everything he could. Every book he picked up, he would say, Lord, what can you use from this book? to prepare me for Africa. He learned to make his own clothes. He learned to make shoes out of leather. He learned how to handle iron in a blacksmith's forge. Everything that he thought he would need in his endeavors in Africa. And so in 1881, at the age of 23, Fred Stanley Arnott left from London on a ship for Durban. The man who traveled with him had a complete breakdown on the way and could not continue the journey. And Fred Stanley Arnott began his travel across Africa. It's estimated that by ox cart and on foot and canoe and sometimes carried in a hammock when he wasn't strong enough to stand up, he traveled about 27,000 miles through the uncharted vastness of Africa. He opened up to the gospel what is come to be known as the Beloved Strip, that area through Angola and Congo and Zambia, where tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Africans have put their trust in Christ. Perhaps one of the greatest areas of blessing anywhere in the world. In his journeys, after some years of laboring in uh, various parts of Africa, he heard the name of an African king named Mushidi. Mushidi had 500 wives, and he ruled a vast empire. He traded in salt and copper and ivory and slaves. He was one of the chief slave traders of that region. Uh, they estimate that only one in five Africans actually survived the journey to the coast before they began their long and arduous ship journey to become slaves in the so-called free world. Kind of ironic title that is. This Mashidi, he had his garden festooned with the skulls of his victims. And he had one large white stake in the center of his garden, which he said was going to hold the head of the first white man to enter his kingdom. Uh, undeterred by this, Fred Arnott sent word to the king and said that he wanted to come and present the good news to his people. And uh, Mashidi gathered together his fortune tellers, his wise men, to ask them to divine if 
Fred Stanley Arnott's heart was as white as his skin. <laughs> and they determined that he was an honest person and that he could be dealt with fairly. And so he was given an invitation to come. In December of 1887, Charles Swan and William Faulkner arrived at Mashidi's capital in Katanga. And they had walked 1,200 miles by foot in simply a period of three months in order to join Arnott there in uh, this territory. And Arnott went in, put on his best clothes, and surrounded by a crowd of the local people, the three men met under the shade of a stockade that was topped with human skulls, and the three of them began to sing. And they sang these words, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does his successive journeys run, his kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more. You know, Arnott felt at that point that this was to be the beginning of the work of God in the territory known as the Garangansi. He was the first white man to see the headwaters of the Zambezi River and discovered that all through this region of Africa was massive wealth. The copper mines and other precious, semi-precious metals could have made him a fortune. In South Africa, the well-known financier and entrepreneur uh, Cecil Rhodes had essentially enslaved the Africans to do his bidding to bring out of these mines the gold and the diamonds of South Africa and became fabulously wealthy in what he did. He met Fred Stanley Arnott sometime later and uh, at that time he said to Arnott, why did you not capture for yourselves the rights to the mines of Central Africa? You could have been a fabulously wealthy man. And Fred Stanley Arnott said to Cecil Rhodes, are you a happy man? And Cecil Rhodes dropped his head and said, I don't know the meaning of the word. Instead of that, Fred Stanley Arnott was more interested in digging out of the mines of this earth, the precious gems that someday would be the diadem of the king's glory in heaven. His story is told in his own autobiography, Garanganzi, or Mission Work in Central Africa, Fred Stanley Arnott. Uh, when I lived in Grand Rapids, Michigan, there was a wonderful artist there, and I commissioned him to paint for me a painting of uh, Fred Stanley Arnott, and this is the painting that he did. It's been a, a thrill to me to read the stories of Arnott in uh, Tiernest Wilson's book, Angola Beloved, and other biographies that tell the story of this faithful man who, against all odds, went into some of the darkest places of the earth and shone the gospel light and how God used him in saving many souls. It was those very verses in Ephesians chapter 5, in some of the darkest days when he was alone and sick, had been robbed and thought he might die, that he laid claim to those beautiful words and concluded that the love of the Lord was enough to triumph in the world. And certainly this is the message of the Bible, that there is a greater force in the universe than power and that is love, the love of God, and love is going to win the day.